Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome to Writing Out Loud. My guests today are Jean Hager and Janelle Dillon. Jean's latest books are The Fire Carrier and Death on the Drunkard's Path and Janelle's latest book is Red Sky Warrior. Thank you both for being here. Thank, Thank you. you, Teresa. Jean, you write mysteries. Do people have certain misconceptions about mystery writers? Because I was talking to one person, he said, you know that that Jean Hager is mysterious. <laughs> Do people have crazy notions about what a mystery writer's well, life is uh, like? You know, people have uh, one or two people have asked, "Why do you want to, why do you want to write about murder?" But uh, I don't. Cons I'm, that's not the main point of writing mysteries. You're ri you're writing about people, uh, and uh, I don't know why that person thought I was a mysterious person. Maybe because when I don't know someone, I'm not real outgoing. No, <laughs> oh, I, I don't think you're the least bit mysterious, but I think that we ha attach a lure, a certain allure to different kinds of writers. And You know, I was thinking Jessica Fletcher, a lot of us think of Jessica Fletcher uh, when we think of mystery writers mm -hmm. now, and I've never seen you out riding your bicycle. And, and no, I should be, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you're not doing no, I'm that. Not. In fact, I think we even have a misconception about this word mystery, because when we say mystery now, we're not just talking about one kind of book, are we? There's no. several different kinds of mysteries. There are numbers of subgenres with in the mystery, hard boiled, soft boiled, amateur sleuth, police procedural. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of different kinds of, there's a wide variety out there. If you want to read mysteries, you can probably find something you like. How would you categorize the types of mysteries you write? Uh, I would definitely, the Iris House books, Death on the Drunkard Path, is what are called cozies. Uh, there's an amateur sleuth and they're very light hearted. Mm -hmm. uh, the, my Cherokee mysteries, uh, although one has a Police chief and one has one. De the other detective is an investigator for the Cherokee Nation. I, I consider them traditional mysteries in that they uh, concentrate on the puzzle more than on police procedure. Okay. And when you talk about police procedure, there are actually novels that just deal with like the technique of police. Well, work. of course, they have a mystery. I mean, they have a, a murder to solve too. But uh, there's more w in the squad room. Uh, and the t detectives are more realistic, they're more like what real detectives like, their days are more like what real detectives' uh, days are like, and usually those are set in large cities. And do you have to do research? Uh, actually, I don't do a lot of research on the police procedure because I just don't use a lot of it. Now, I do know you've been in jail before because <laughs> Janelle and I were with you. You were right. visiting down in Tahlequah, and we asked to go into jail, and there were some prisoners there who wondered what in the world we had done. Right. <laughs> and we were being ushered in. And we were hoping we were going to get out of there pretty quick. Yes. It's not a very pleasant place to be. Well, when I whispered to one of the prisoners, you know, we're just here researching a book, <laughs> and she said, oh, yeah, I've heard that one before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a likely story. And Janelle, you write romance novels. Are there... Uh, stereotypes about what a romance author's life is like, other than the fact that I know you're very glamorous and run around with Fabio. <laughs> well, yes, I think so. I, I don't know that it's so much that our readers think that we are glamorous, but they want to know what our lives are like. Mm -hmm. I think that's very true of most romance writers. I don't know whether it's because of the kind of book we write makes them feel very close to us or what, but I, I know that that is one thing. That's one reason I do a newsletter with each book because readers really do like to feel they know you personally. Do they write you a lot and ask you questions? Yes, they do. They write and ask questions and they write and give their opinions. Uh, I had some, at one point I, in my Cherokee series, I did the last book was really a prequel. Mm -hmm. It really took place years and years before the first book in that series. And I had many letters about that. And I also had letters with people saying when I would do for example, in that same series, the second book was about the son of the couple in the first book. And I had people write me and say, but you skipped all this 20 years of their lives and I wanted to see them raise their children and, and build mm -hmm. up their plantation. Mm -hmm. So the readers feel close enough not only to ask you questions, but to give you their opinions too about what you ought to do. And I think that's true to a certain extent with mysteries too, isn't it, Jane? Yes, it is. Uh, they, and it's, it's interesting in that they, that they want to know about the characters more than the plot. I mean, uh, rarely do you get a question about the plot, but they want to know about uh, what's going to happen in the love relationships, what's going to happen with Mitch and his daughter and this kind of thing, which, which is flattering to me because it means that those mm -hmm. characters are real to them. Well, that's what you meant a while ago when you were talking about a mystery. Really, there's a lot more to a mystery yes. than just just the plot or mm -hmm. the the who done it aspect. Yes. There's a lot of why done it too, and family relationships yes. and so on. And the murder almost, in some respects, becomes incidental, doesn't it? It, it does uh, in a way. Uh, it, it's kind of driving the plot, but uh, the characters and their 
uh, motivations are very important. Janelle, we were talking to Jean about different categories of mysteries. Is that true with romance as oh, well? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, there are historicals and contemporaries, of course. And some people, I have met a few people who read both, but lots and lots of times romance readers read either one or the other. They really like contemporaries or they really like historicals. But then within those uh, broad divisions, there are lots and lots of smaller divisions. And I get letters from people who say, I am a fan of Indian romance. So they read only the Native American romances. So there are lots and lots of smaller, paranormal um, ones with the intrigue subplots. There's all different kinds, you know, different paranormal lengths. Paranormal romances. Now that's <laughs> intriguing to me. I mean, we could go a long way yes, with that. But and we time won't. travel. <laughs> time travel romances uh -huh. and, and also, how would you characterize what you uh, write? Well, what I write is basically a, an historical romance. I usually try to use a lot of adventure a lot of action along with the romantic story. Um, and my books always include uh, a hero who is Native American, half maybe, or sometimes a full blood. And I'm doing trilogies. I've sort of gotten started in this pattern of doing trilogies about different tribes. So I've done a Cherokee trilogy, a Comanche trilogy, and now a Choctaw trilogy. You know, we've talked about categorizing books and categorizing authors, but really aren't there certain challenges that writers face, no matter if they write mysteries or romances, are there certain things that we all have in common, certain struggles? Certainly. Mm -hmm. What are some of them? That, that, what's one of the hardest things, Jane, you as a writer have to face? I think it's one of the hardest is trying to stay fresh, particularly when you're writing a series. Um, you're dealing with the character's li ongoing life story as well as that particular mystery story in that book. And uh, you don't want to repeat something that you've done before. You want your characters to change and grow. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's rather a challenge. And how many books have you written? I know it's an enormous number. Oh, 55 or so. And Not that many mysteries, probably 11 or 12 mysteries. So you have a, a lot of history, a lot of characters back of you that yes. you're, you're trying to keep fresh. And I, I think you've done a wonderful job, and, and particularly in Fire Carry, which the Fire Carry, which is one of my favorite books Thank now. Thank you. And Janelle, uh, and you as a writer, what special challenges have you faced? What do you have to worry about as a writer? Well, I think that, I think Jean hit on one thing in that. Our readers who really like our books want the same book again, but different. <laughs> mm -hmm. You uh -huh. know, and so it is a matter of really, really staying fresh because they look for certain elements in my books, but yet it has to be a new book, a new story, new characters. And I think also it's always a challenge to make your characters just as real as possible because I think that's one of the challenges that cuts across all kinds of, of writing is that the characters are so important. I think you're right. And you've been writing, both of you, a long time mm -hmm. now. Does that get easier the more you write? No, it really doesn't. No. Uh, sometimes it's harder. I'm, I'm doing rewrites now on a Molly Bear Paw book and, and I just had to go in and, and you know, almost not start from scratch, but but change a lot of things. I'd, I'd gotten, I wasn't fresh in this book uh, as it was. Uh, and I was so, sort of throwing away some of the emotion that I could have used. So that's what I mean, it, it doesn't get any easier. Janelle, what about you? The, would you agree with that? And revisions, well, do you have to do a lot of revisions? Sometimes I do. I, like Comanche Rain, for example, I didn't do one thing, not no, no revisions at all. But uh, on this last book that I did, I had to add some chapters at the end and I had to throw out the first 100 pages and write a new 60 pages to take its place. So sometimes I do, it just sort of depends. Uh, the only thing that ever gets easier for me about writing is just actually doing it. If I do it day after day after day for a long period of time, that going in there and getting started becomes easier. But that's the only thing that ever does. We talked about what writers have in common. How important is it for both of you to visit with other writers and get uh, together from time to time? Very important. Why so, Jane? Uh, I just don't think anyone but another writer really understands what you go through in, in writing a book. Uh, you know, your family uh, are supportive. Uh, they're in your corner, they're cheering you on, but they really don't, I think, understand the emotional things that you, you go through uh, a, as you're going through a book. And, and another writer does. You can talk about the business with another writer and that just bores 
other people mm -hmm. who are not in the, that business. And you had to make a different, a difficult transition in your career because you're a very successful romance writer and decided to, to turn to mysteries. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people would say, Jane, why are you doing this? Yes. You had the successful career. Mm -hmm. And I bet your writing friends were very important to you at that time. They really were. And I still have some of those uh, romance writer fr friends. You know, I just consider writers are writers. And uh, right. we all go through the same thing. And I've just gotten a few, more, few new friends in the mystery field. Uh, Janelle, what about you and your writing? Is it important for you to visit with other writers and stay in touch with them? Yes, it really is. And I think a lot of it with me is just simply what Jean said, the emotions. Because, and see, nobody else can help you with the problem either. If you really come up against a problem or if you're just, you just got an idea for some characters and a setting and you want to plot a book, Nobody else can even talk to you about that. I mean, your family tries to. They try to give you, you know, thought. But somehow your mind has to work the way a writer's mind works in order for you to even discuss a story in its planning stages, I think. And I know that we've gotten together, all of us, and, and with Renee Roselle in restaurants and talked through some of your plots, mm -hmm. and we raised a lot of eyebrows in restaurants because people <laughs> think we're talking about real-life incidents. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and fiction is stranger in life, than, than no matter what people uh, say sometimes. Jean, you mentioned the business, and it was interesting to talk mm -hmm. about the business. What is the state of the publishing business right now? We're hearing a lot of scary stories it, from it people is who are to break scary. into it. It is pretty scary right now. It's very tight. Uh, there's l much less interest in mid-list books. Those are the books that are, have always been the bread and butter of, of the publishing business. Books that are not on the bestseller list, but uh, are out there, new ones every month, uh, and do have a good readership. Uh, there seems to be more interest in blockbusters, uh, and so you have less time. I think there was a time when uh, a fiction writer perhaps had seven or eight books to show that he was building a readership. Mm -hmm. Now I think you may be lucky if you get three. If they don't see something happening, they go on to somebody else. Is that a general trend, would you say, or is it just true in, in mystery, or is that also true in romance? Do you know I think that's true across the board because uh, it's such a competitive business now. And sometimes I walk into a bookstore like Barnes & Noble, for example, and there are thousands and thousands, mm -hmm. or Media Play, I go in Media Play, and I think, there are so many books in here, how did I ever even get one published? Mm -hmm. You know, I feel very fortunate to have even been published. But Jean is writing that it's harder and harder to stay published because you're Readership has to build, like always talk about the numbers, which means your sell through, how many books are published and how many actually are sold. And I think it's just, it's a real, real hard business right now. And also it's hard, it's scary for those of us who have had several books out because right now at this moment, the fad is to look for brand new writers mm -hmm. and pay them big bucks for their very first book. So there's no such thing as security in this no, business. No, no. Right. No. And even the writers who are getting uh, perhaps the big bucks on the first book, if they don't uh, live up to expectations, they're probably going to find themselves looking for another publisher after a couple of books. So that's scary. It is. Mm -hmm. it really so there's no security. Even after your 50-some-odd books no. and all the books you've written, no. Janelle, no. you're not sitting at home and think, gosh, I've got this one cracked. No. Let's talk some more. We're going to take a brief, brief break and be back with more with Gene Hager and Janelle Dellen. This is an RSU-TV Encore presentation of Writing Out Loud. Welcome back to Writing Out Loud. I'm visiting with Jean Hager and Janelle Dellen. Thank you guys for sticking around. Gene, your latest book is The Fire Carrier. It's a new Mitch Bushyhead. He's one of your most popular uh, characters. It's Cherokee Mystery. Tell us about the Cherokee myth, The Fire Carrier. Well, I found that myth in a uh, book of research material uh, which was done, uh, originally written prior to the removal uh, from the East. Uh, and there was a light that, could, that would appear and no one could explain it. Uh, whether it was fog, whatever, nobody mm -hmm. knew. But the Cherokees made a story about it. And they said it was a, the fire carrier who was an evil spirit who, who uh, rode around at night carrying a light. And uh, they were frightened of him. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that was the germ uh, of that book. And I moved the myth to Oklahoma. And uh, I, leave, I sort of leave the reader to decide if it's real, there really is a fire carrier or not. What do you think or will you tell us? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, there have been such lights in different places around the country. I've read about them. One, there's one near Noel, Missouri, mm -hmm. uh, often called the spook light or mm -hmm. the ghost light. 
I think it's probably some natural phenomenon, uh, but it's kind of fun not to have it explained. Mm -hmm. And maybe the natural mm -hmm. phenomenon is the fire carrier. Uh, I mean, it could be. Like at, How do we know? Look at, look at it that way. You were able to do something in this book that we, your fans have been waiting for for a long time, and that is Molly Bearpaw, the heroine of your other mystery series, which is set in Tahlequah. The Mitch books are set in Buckskin, is actually mentioned in this book. Yes. Uh, People have asked me, when are you going to have Mitch and Molly solve a crime together? And I don't know if that will ever happen, but I thought that, was, that would be fun to put that in. It's kind of an inside joke for people who, who read both series and know who Molly is. Right. And there's one other crossover character, isn't there? Uh, uh, yes, the, the medical examiner appears the in both. The coroner. He appears in both books. Are you trying to tell us something that this is what links these two series as the coroner? You know, I wondered about that on a symbolic Freudian level. Well, I thought he, he works in Cherokee and Adair County, and both of these series take place in Cherokee County, so it seemed natural that he would, should be in both books. You also have fun with your writing and making references to, to friends yes. or to events, and I know you've mentioned Janelle in one of her books and yes. one of your mysteries. And in this book, you mentioned the Native American artist uh, Merv Jacob. I did. And you also mentioned the celebration of books, yes. which is uh, yes. held at UC too. Yes. Is that a way for you when you're writing to be a little bit playful, even when you're dealing? It, it with really serious is. It, it's fun for me to think of. Uh, you know, you can't just stick it in for no reason, but. If something comes up naturally, it's fun to use a real event or a real person. And we should emphasize this is a very serious bit because it deals with a, a, a serious social problem, that is domestic abuse. Yes. In fact, I, I realize that I have used that in at least two books. Uh, so it's something that's very much on my mind, and I think you know we hear more and more about it these, these days. Uh, I'm not sure that it's more prevalent. Maybe we just uh, it's more, more reported now. And you also have another series, As If Two Weren't Enough, and that features Tess Darcy, mm -hmm. and she owns a bed and breakfast in Missouri. Yes. And your latest book is Death on the Drunkard's Path. That uh, Tess has joined a quilt guild and is learning to quilt, and so she, they, uh, she, they are sponsoring the local uh, quilt show and sale, which they have every year. A big one. It's a big mm -hmm. one. They, people come from all around, and so she is helping with their quilt guild's booth, and there is a murder at the quilt show. Is it hard for you to, to shift from the Cherokee stories to Missouri and to a whole different environment? Well, it, it's really kind of refreshing for me uh, to, to break from one setting and go to another. Um, I, I think, I'm afraid I'd get stale if I stuck with the same one all the time. So that's part of what you do to keep fresh. Yes, it is. Is there any chance that Mitch and Molly are going to get married and honeymoon at Tessa's place? I don't think so. <laughs> would that just be too <laughs> that much be for too me much, to, to, right. to hope for? And Janelle, your latest book is Red Sky Warrior. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, this uh, is a book that really started with a germ of an idea, as Jean was saying hers did. Uh, I heard somewhere that sometimes people who are about to be hanged would be set free if they would marry somebody respectable. <laughs> and that just uh -huh. sort of really, um, that idea <laughs> <laughs> intrigued me. Mm -hmm. So I started out wanting a heroine to save a hero from hanging. And that's how this book started. And I immediately thought about Judge Parker's court because I'm from Poto, which is close to Fort Smith, and I've heard about Judge Parker and his court all my life. And so he hangs so many people, I thought, well, that'd be the perfect judge for this. <laughs> but as often happens in writing, the book actually is very different from what I had was seeing in my mind when I started mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, our hero is part Choctaw, half Choctaw, and uh, he accidentally kills a white man and is immediately arrested and everybody is already saying he's gonna hang. He's, mm -hmm. Before he even has a trial, he's judged guilty and is sentenced. And the heroine is a very spunky socialite. All this starts in Van Buren, Arkansas. And uh, the heroine is a spunky little socialite from that town who is desperately, she has a terrible, domineering, very cruel and mean father who has arranged for her to marry somebody else. So in order to get to the ranch in Texas that her grandfather left to her, she has to have somebody, to, a man, to take her there and escort her because it's an extremely dangerous mm -hmm, journey. Mm -hmm. So anyway, she blackmails the sheriff, gets him out of jail, and he takes her to Texas. So that's how it gets started. Well, you had an interesting marketing issue come up with this, didn't you, in terms of the title and the cover? Yes, yes. Tell we us a little bit of that. In fact, all of, all of my friends, all of us <laughs> went through a great deal. This talks about the writing community. Book. Let's share that yes, with everyone. Yes, now there's a perfect <laughs> example. Someone who isn't a writer has a hard time helping you name a book. 
But uh, we went through everything because uh, this book at first had no sunset scene, no, you know, uh, important sunset scene, nothing to do about the sun. And one day my editor called me up and said, well, the art department wants to put a sun on the front of this book and have a sunset scene on the back. And we need a title, a different title, a big epic title with maybe the word heat in it or <laughs> burning or something like that. Uh -huh. So this was a total shock to me, the whole concept. So I managed to get the scenes in that I thought needed to go because somehow I feel, I'd like to have the cover have something to do with the book. Right. So I was <laughs> trying to get these scenes you in. You idealist. So yes, I know, I know, so unrealistic. So anyway, though, we went through lots and lots of... Uh, uh, burning suns and burning skies and all kinds of things trying to, to name this book and we finally came up with Red Sky Woman which uh, I think that was my agent's idea and, sh and we like that except that in this book the heroine is white mm -hmm. and Red Sky Woman sounds like an Indian heroine but then my editor made the leap when I told her that she said no I don't like it it sounds like a saga and it doesn't really fit mm -hmm. this book mm -hmm. but then she made the leap to Red Sky Warrior which is really perfect you mentioned earlier that you've written about the Cherokees, the Comanches, and now the Choctaws. And we talked about stereotyping. Do people tend to stereotype Native Americans and think all Native Americans are the same without realizing mm -hmm. that there are significant differences between, between the different tribes? Yeah, yeah. A lot of people in New York, a lot of people in publishing, uh, really think that they're all Plains Indians. They all live in teepees. Um, they all go on vision quests all the time. Um, and many times when they're trying to help you, even if, whether you want to be helped or not, <laughs> they'll suggest this kind of scene or something like that. And in fact, my editor at one point said something about uh, the teepee, the Choctaws lived in the teepee. And so it's, it's sort of a mission on my part to try to educate mm -hmm. these people, but I don't know if it's going to work. Or not. <laughs> You're sort of a missionary to the east, <laughs> right. so to speak. Jean, you got a wonderful uh, review of uh, the Fire Carrier and Publishers Weekly. Janelle, you got a wonderful review of Red Sky Warrior in the Detroit Free Press. When you get reviews like that, the book is finished, can you just sit back and relax and say, oh gosh, the hard work is over? Does that happen? Or are you feeling the pressure well, already to do another book? Well, you're already into another book usually by that time, but you are sort of anxiously at the back of your mind waiting for some reviews to come out, and it's always a relief when they're good. Mm -hmm. What do you do with a bad review? Uh, Forget it. <laughs> That's why you went into murder. I think I got a little frustration. You just have here. to realize that not everyone is going to love your books. And uh, there are a couple of publications which seem to delight in uh, finding something wrong with books, the books they review. Uh, so I know that about this one uh, publication in particular, and I've gotten some good reviews and I've gotten some bad ones there. So I don't really uh, let it bother me so much anymore. You're both to the stages in your career, and I started to say enviable stage, but I'm not sure because I know it's hard work. When you write, can sell books on the basis of a proposal, how hard is it to write a proposal for a book project, to, to put it all in? How long is a proposal, for example, well, Jean, for I, I think that, that varies. Uh, with my Cherokee books, uh, I, my editor just calls and says, send me an, an idea for each book. We used to do two book mm -hmm. contracts. Mm -hmm. So it's probably less than a page. She wants a title. She wants kind of a general idea who's going to be murdered uh, and maybe a little bit of the surrounding suspects. So I usually do that in a page. And of course, sometimes it turns out to be very different when you start when you write the book. That's what I was going to ask if you had some flexibility. Uh, yes, you really do. Uh, well, Janelle, I think perhaps with Avon, we both work for Avon too. My other books is my other mm -hmm. series with Avon. They require more detailed synopsis and is that hard, Janelle, to come up with? And how long do your proposals have to be? Well, this last one I just did was, I think, 13 pages when it was done. And it's, sometimes it's hard because, especially within, working within a series, because my editor gets an idea of what <laughs> she thinks these characters should do or what this <laughs> should be for the next book. You know, mm -hmm. she gets so involved that she wants the characters. For example, I have a book coming out in December called Silver Moon Song. And that's the second book in this trilogy. And now I'm planning, I'm starting the third book. And she loved those characters in Silver Moon Song so much, she suggested several things I could do in this third book, which is going to be called Blue River Star. Could it be, and this just is a wild guess on my part, that some editors are frustrated writers? Mm -hmm. Is that a dangerous thing to have happen? Uh, yeah, you, you can, you have to always remember it's your book. Uh, but on the other hand, a good editor is worth her weight in gold. Yes, they are. Because she can see things that you're too close to see. Uh, 
it's when they start changing scenes and rewriting your words that you begin to think, well, maybe they are a frustrated writer. And if you feel strongly about something, you don't have to change it. You don't have to do what they say. Uh, I always just try to listen and try to be objective, and very often they're right. I know writing is very important to both of you. We just have a couple of minutes left here, and I thought we might spend these last two minutes talking about how do you balance everything? Because you have families, uh, you have a lot of outside interests. Is it hard sometimes to be a writer, James? Yes, it is. There are times when you think, oh, I'd just like to do nothing today. I would just like to go to the mall. And you can do that once in a while, but when you have deadlines, you can't do that every day. Uh, and in the summertime, particularly my daughter who teaches school now, since her, her children are a little older, I would like to be doing things with her. And so you have to give up some things to pursue your writing you really career. Do. What about you, Janelle? That's really true. You, people who want to write lots of times or beginning writers, try to do everything else and then when all everything's done and their house is clean and their meals are cooked they write and you can't do that mm -hmm. I mean it's a job you have to go to it every day and you have to put it first you have to really uh, you know it has to be a major priority in your life have there been times when it's not been for you I mean you, yes. your son just went off to college this last year yes and that has, that has made it easier for me to write in a way because uh, one thing, I'm more lonesome so it takes my mind off that if I write, but also uh, not to have that other person needing things uh, from me or coming in and out or that kind of thing because it takes a lot of focus to write. You really have to get your mind on it and keep it there. Except you do have a temperamental cat named Tiger Tom yes. who's very demanding and you have a dog, miniature schnauzer named Missy, who's right. going to kind of keep you in line one way right. or the other. I'll be sitting there writing and she'll come up with her little stuffed toy and rare upon me want me to play with her. Say so enough is, is enough, yeah. Jean. Jean, congratulations on the fire carrier and death on the drunkard's path. Janelle, congratulations on Red Sky Warrior. Thank you both Thank for joining you. us. Thank all of you for joining us on Writing Out Loud.